I am Kat Schroeder. I'm a PhD student at the University of New Mexico. And this is a presentation on a recent paper that I, that I did with co-authors Kate Lyons and Felisa Smith. Um, it was published in Science. Um, so it is available. I will give you the citation at the very end if you want to go read more about it. So as something of a roadmap, um, just to begin with, because this is a little, a little bit of a longer talk, um, we'll do a bit of introduction. So we'll talk about the importance of body size. Why do we care about uh, how big animals are? We'll look a little bit at what we know about modern things. So a lot of my research is focused on um, how do we understand dinosaurs based on the ecology of modern organisms? So we'll look at some modern mass distribution, body mass, um, and compare those to what we know about non-avian dinosaurs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about taphonomy, which is how uh, organisms are buried, um, how things become fossilized, because it's a really important thing when we're talking about the fossil record. After we do that, that will bring us to our first question, which is uh, in regards to local scale body size distributions. So when we're looking at the communities of dinosaurs, what does that tell us about dinosaur ecology? Uh, from there, we'll look at the some of the drivers behind dinosaur diversity um, with a specific focus on ontogeny, which is how organisms grow. So how do you start uh, as an egg and then get into the sizes that we see dinosaurs hitting? We will do um, from there a quick sum up of what we found in the paper, um, and we'll talk about some leftover burning questions that are starting to get, get addressed a little bit by some other researchers. Um, and then we'll take a look at some, uh, some of the work that I'm doing, um, some of the work that those other researchers doing and, and possibly bring up some more questions that we wanna look at. And then hopefully after all of that, um, you folks will have some questions. Um, and with that, now that we have a roadmap, let's, let's get rocking and rolling. So modern ecology, right? Um, George Bartholomew, who is the, uh, basically the academic great-grandfather of, of every ornithologist in the United States, um, he pointed out that some of the most important attributes of any animal are is its size, right? So how big it gets. Um, and that's because body size is, is proportionately related to just a huge variety of physiological and ecological traits. So everything from range size to metabolism to energy flux, generation time, clutch size, all of these things are co-varying traits um, that that by and large, we can't really measure in the fossil record because it would require you know, a time machine for us to go back and, and actually look at an animal doing a lot of these things. So understanding the proxies for them, things like body size, um, is hugely important if we want to actually understand more about the ecology of non-avian dinosaurs. So what do we actually know about dinosaur body size? Well, um, in 2012, O'Gorman and Hone um, took a really great uh, look at the a global sampling of dinosaurs. So they, they looked all the way across the globe, um, sampled a, a, somewhere around 300 different species. Um, and they found this really interesting kind of pattern that dinosaurs exhibit what we call a left skewed distribution. So basically, the majority of known uh, non-avian dinosaurs are actually large bodied. And that's a little bit odd because what we know about modern birds and reptiles and mammals is that they all tend to skew in the exact opposite direction. They tend to skew to the right. So most modern terrestrial vertebrates have their highest diversity. So the more, more species of modern vertebrates are small organisms. And energetically, this makes sense. Um, because the smaller the uh, the smaller you are, the uh, the less room you need, the less food you need. Um, basically, you can if you if you were to take an elephant and an elephant shrew, um, you can pack more elephant shrews into a room than you could elephants, right? So, given the same amount of energy, um, you can just pack more small organisms into the same amount of space as large organisms. So, we tend to expect to see this kind of right skewed distribution where most of the diversity is in those small body sizes, and then you're kind of trailing off um, once you get larger and larger and larger. The other thing that we know about global dinosaur diversity is that it's weirdly low. So modern vertebrates, mammals, reptiles, birds, um, they all tend to be in the thousands to tens of thousands of species. Um, but based on what we know about the fossil record, non-avian dinosaurs are, are under 2000 species. 
Um, and that's despite being the dominant organism on the, in, on the planet for 150 million years. So even looking at the difference between all of fossil dinosaurs um, compared to all of fossil mammals and living mammals, um, dinosaurs are very, very depauperate. So at this point, knowing, knowing what we know about um, the low species diversity of dinosaurs and their, their kind of weird left skew, we start to kind of ask ourselves, what is going on? Why is dinosaur diversity so low? And why do they have that kind of backwards body size distribution? In order to examine this question, the first thing that we have to do is address the fact that when we study non-avian dinosaurs, we're working with a very limited data set. So the fossil record is not perfect. Um, not everything fossilizes. In fact, most things don't fossilize. Um, and Caleb Brown et al, um, he's done some fantastic work um, looking at the potential for taphonomic bias in the fossil record. Um, and particularly what he's shown is that small dinosaur taxa, things that are below 100 kilograms, 60 kilograms, um, those are the ones that tend to be underrepresented in the fossil record. Um, and he, he very much emphasized the importance of taking things like collection bias and preservation bias into account when we're looking at dinosaur diversity. So what are those? Real quick, pres preservation bias is uh, the unequal fossilization of a species or an individual of a species. Um, Kate Berensmeyer has done really fantastic work in this area, um, looking at the preservation bias of uh, the modern African savannas. So, um, again, looking at modern organisms to understand extinct organisms, um, they basically took a look at, you know, when an organism dies on the, on the savanna, what is really left after a certain period of time? What gets washed away? What gets destroyed? Um, and they generally found that things that have body masses under 100 kilograms are the ones that tend to be the most frequently transported or consumed or just otherwise destroyed. Um, and they are therefore the least likely to become fossilized. Um, so this act this fits really well with what um, Brown and all have found um, with dinosaurs under 60 kilograms being missing from the fossil record. Here we have a modern analog that is again showing us that everything below 100 kilograms is, is pretty unlikely to become fossilized because it's being destroyed or, or taken away in some way. Collection bias, on the other hand, tends to be the result of scientists uh, having a specific purpose when we go out and do collecting. So um, if you're interested in finding the world's oldest dinosaur, you're unlikely to end up uh, collecting a Tyrannosaurus rex because T-Rex is at the very end of the Cretaceous, so it's not particularly old in terms of non-avian dinosaurs. As anyone who has read anything about the Bone Wars knows, um, a lot of paleontology has been driven by um, museums or private collectors that were very interested in having the biggest dinosaurs. Um, and on top of that, you just, big dinosaurs are kind of easier to find when you're out collecting, you know, it's, it's, you're not picking through tiny little ant hills that, that happen to collect, you know, very, very small bones. So we have this kind of dual problem that bigger dinosaurs are, are more likely to be, uh, preserved, um, and they're more likely to be collected. That seems pretty compelling, but there is a bit of a problem with, ascribing the entirety of that weird left skew to taphonomy. Um, and it's a problem that, that O'Gorman and Hone actually addressed in their paper. Um, and they, they make note that basically, in order for um, dinosaurs to even look like fossil mammals, we would have to be missing somewhere right around 90% of all non-avian dinosaur diversity in the fossil record. And all of that 90% would need to be from dinosaurs that are below that 60 kilogram mass cutoff um, for taphonomy. And of course, this is problematic because we keep finding giant dinosaurs. So, um, well, taphonomy, preservation bias, collection bias, they are undoubtedly important. They, they absolutely bias the fossil record um, away from, from small, very small individuals it doesn't seem to appear that it can actually explain this entire trend that we see. So um, as a biologist or as, as a person that is trained in, in modern biology, um, I think that there's something more going on here and, and my co-authors tend to agree. So specifically um, what we think uh, 
that something is, is more ecological. If we think it's ecology, how do we figure this out, right? So we know from modern ecology that global distributions, like the one that O'Gorman and Hone did, um, they, they result from large scale drivers. So things like climate change, um, evolution, plate tectonics, things that act on multiple species uh, or multiple groups of species um, over large areas and over a, a long period of time. All of those things kind of drive that global distribution. But if we want to look at the, at the ecology, we can look at small scale distributions because those are the ones that are actually reflective of, of ecological drivers. So the interactions between species be, or even between individuals of a species um, happening over fairly small areas pretty rapidly. So if body size distributions at the local scale don't match the global scale, so if the small scale doesn't match the, the large scale, uh, there's a pretty good chance that that is an indication that something ecological is going on that is causing that change. So this brings us to our first question that we addressed in our paper. Um, and that is, we know what the dinosaur global distribution looks like, um, mass distribution, but what does it look like at smaller scales? Um, so we would predict that dinosaur mass distributions at the local level, the community level, aren't going to really mirror that global distribution because we think that something biological or, or uh, something in their ecology is, is actually driving um, their, their mass distributions. So to answer this question, we need to look at a bunch of communities, right? So uh, in order to do this, we go to the PBDB, the Paleobiology Database. Um, and we spent quite some time compiling 43 different communities um, from every continent, um, from a huge variety of biomes, um, tons of different latitudes, kind of trying to uh, avoid any kind of a priority assumption about um, you know, which communities are we going to use. Um, together, uh, the nice thing about this is that we ended up collecting communities that, that um, together contain over 550 species. So that's a, a large chunk of all of the non-avian dinosaur diversity that we even know of. And it, as an important note, um, because this has come up in, in the wake of us publishing, um, it, the PBDB is a fantastic resource, um, but by no means can, can the data simply be downloaded and, and picked through. You really, really have to clean a lot of this data um, just to make sure that you are looking at the, at the most recent um, known species lists. Once we clean this, so meaning uh, that we are removing synonyms, we are double checking that everything is, is current, so it's, it's not an old name or, you know, it's not something that has been, you know, subsequently found to not be a tyrannosaur, it's really or a nithopod or something like that. On top of all of that cleaning, we, we chose to not look at ichnotaxa. So these are things like trace fossils, footprints, um, if you are interested in that, there's actually a, a new paper by Martin Lockley and Lita Jing who um, have done basically this exact thing with ichnotaxa. The reason that we didn't look at ichnotaxa is because it's very, very hard to compare ichnotaxa to known body fossils. And it's also almost impossible to figure out trophic level for ichnotaxa. Um, so that's why we specifically didn't, didn't use them in our paper. From there, um, once we, we have everything cleaned and, and make sure that we're only looking at the body fossils, um, we start to limit our communities to faunal assemblages as much as we can. So these are things where we actually, we can pick out and say, yeah, these guys were actually living at the same time. There's not some faunal shift within a formation. Um, this also very fortunately limits our time averaging through, through a formation. So for things like Hell Creek, um, not so much of a problem because Hell Creek only spans, you know, half a million years. Um, but for some of those larger formations, um, things like Cedar Mountain that, that span multiple millions of years, um, we really did try and truncate that so that we were, we were pretty convinced that these animals are living in the same community at the same time and potentially interacting. And then after everything, um, all of the cleaning, removing ichnotaxa, making sure that, that our organisms are actually you know, in the same place at the same time. We then spent a long, long time going through the literature, adding mass estimates, 
um, and to avoid differences in estimation technique, because if you're doing things like volumetric uh, versus uh, limb bone scaling, you get very, very different estimates for, for masses for a lot of these dinosaurs. In order to avoid the uh, any potential influence of that, um, we used averages of, of multiple estimations whenever we could. So for things like Tyrannosaurus rex, which has been hugely studied as far as its mass goes, um, I think we had something like nine different mass estimates that, that we averaged together to get our kind of middle of the road there. Um, and uh, just as a note, we only used um, taxa that were um, known below the family level. So anything that, that um, if you happen to look at, at the paper, you might note that we do have things that are, uh, you know, Manoraptor spa. Um, that's not saying that it, it's just some unknown Manoraptor. That is a situation where uh, somebody named something and maybe it, it became a dubious naming um, but it is actually identified to, you know, this is something different. It is a different species. It is not a generalization from the, the clay level. It is something that has been identified as unique. We just don't know exactly what it is. So for those situations, um, we didn't just average the entire clay for, for mass estimations. We did specifically look at the morphology of that animal and figure out what is it closest to in mass and, and get an estimate that way. Um, all of our analyses for mass use log 10. Um, so that it's a really common way of, of looking at, at uh, data that has a huge range. And of course, looking at dinosaurs, particularly sauropods, um, you're, you're working across, you know, tens of thousands of kilograms down to, you know, half, you know, less than a kilogram. Um, so that, that becomes very, very useful. Um, Throughout this presentation, all of uh, the dinosaurs in our communities were assigned fairly basic trophic levels. Um, so basically just herbivore, carnivore. Um, anything that uh, like cating nathids are very, very enigmatic. We're not entirely certain what they're doing. Um, anything like that, we tended to err on the side of carnivore, um, but there are some, some specific theropods that, that we note um, are, are almost certainly or definitely herbivorous. Um, so for the rest of this presentation, anything that is color coded in blue is going to be an herbivore. Anything that is yellow is going to be a carnivore. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, most theropods are carnivorous um, and we tend to use that as kind of a shorthand to refer to carnivorous dinosaurs. But that is not to say that we, we classified all theropods as, as carnivorous. Obviously, things like therizinosaurs and, and ornithomimosaurs, um, these are coded as herbivores. Once we do all of this, um, we, we end up with a history that looks something like this. When we're looking at a, a single community, um, we dump all of the, the species into mass bins, um, and we can see that there are certain spikes in certain areas. So once again, we start to see um, this is the Horseshoe Canyon, for example, from Alberta. We start to see that there's a, a solid diversity of large herbivorous dinosaurs, um, and there's some, some good diversity in smaller carnivorous dinosaurs. Similarly, for the Morrison Formation, we see that influence of, of all of those giant sauropods and the, the spike in that, that log 10-4 bin, which is 10,000 kilograms. Um, and when you stick all of those 43 communities that we measured side by side, we can start to see the kind of average community shape. Um, and once we have this, this average community shape, we can start to statistically compare that to the global distribution. Um, when I refer to global distribution, we did not use uh, O'Gorman and Hones. We built our own, which was actually a, a significantly larger global distribution. Um, I think ours contains something like 1300 species. Um, so we have a very, very, very diverse uh, global distribution. And when we do that, um, we start to see that the global and local distributions don't match. So uh, within the community distribution, that average community, we start to lose that strong left skew. So the skew towards large body, large body size, um, the average community shape has a very distinct kind of bimodal distribution. So it has this dual peak kind of shape. We also find that the shape of community distributions are very similar to one another. 
So across biomes, across time averaging, uh, regardless of the species that are present, regardless of the continent that it's from, communities, dinosaur community distributions um, seem to be very, very similar to one another. So they are consistently uh, different from the global, consistently similar to, to each other. Um, and that tells us, generally speaking, that there is some kind of shared ecological driver that is affecting the shape of dinosaur mass distributions. So that difference between the global and the local, and then the similarity between the, the different local communities is really pointing us towards um, ecology. The problem is that we still don't know what that specific ecological driver is. So in order to do that, we need to take a closer look at those community level distributions. If we start with the herbivores, we look at the herbivores alone, we see that they still have a lot of that strong left skew. They have a lot of that large body size um, distribution. Um, and they don't really differ very much from their global distribution. Mathematically, they're, they're not significantly, significantly different. So we can see in the combined likelihood line um, that the 100 to 3,000 kilogram bin, bins are filled with, with quite, uh, quite good regularity. Um, we have relatively high diversity um, maintained even down to the 100 kilogram bins um, and then lower diversity below that. And this is interesting. This is, this is that shift towards, towards large body size. But for herbivores, it actually makes a lot of sense if you start to think about things like gigantothermy. Um, thermal inertia, right? So once you get to a certain size, it becomes quite easy to maintain body temperature. Maintaining a body temperature allows you to maintain a really diverse gut, fl gut flora. And that gut flora allows you to digest really kind of uh, energetically poor materials. So large herbivorous dinosaurs actually benefit from, from being big because it allows them to be very energetically, inefficient, uh, energetically efficient. Um, on top of that, we, we start to see increased protective benefits of large size. So once you're hitting adult sauropod size, there's not many carnivores that are really going to be able to eat you in your prime. Maybe if you're, if you're dropping dead, they can, they can munch on your body. Um, or if you're a, a very small sauropod yet, um, you might, you know, be, be still in that danger zone of being munched on. Um, but once you hit a certain size, you're, you're pretty safe. We see uh, something similar in modern African mammals like elephants. Not many things are, are hunting full grown, healthy elephants um, just because of the disparity in, in carnivore to herbivore size. Conversely, looking at the carnivores, we can see where that bimodality in the, the uh, our combined community uh, average came from. So um, unlike herbivores, carnivores have very high diversity in small body sizes. Interestingly, they tend to have really high diversity in, in that below 60 kilogram size. So below 100 kilograms, 60 kilograms, actually 57% of our entire global distribution is actually made up of these small carnivorous dinosaurs. So this is yet another thing that kind of points us towards taphonomy not really being the driver for this system. Um, carnivores in general do not mirror their global distribution. So the global distribution of carnivores is this kind of flat wiggly line. The, the community distribution is this very strong bimodal distribution. So this really, once again, uh, points us towards an ecological driver for carnivorous dinosaur mass uh, distributions. We also have this very distinct kind of gap. And uh, a lot of our paper is, is kind of focusing on this gap. This is not the first time that this gap has, has been noted. Um, quite a few researchers have, have kind of pointed out or, or just, you know, um, inkled about the fact that there are very few medium-sized carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, and our, looking at our communities, once again, we find that between 100 and 1,000 kilograms, these medium-sized dinosaurs are, it is really, really low, strangely enough. Um, and this is, again, over that size bias kind of threshold. Um, and we see this in almost all of our communities. So somewhere around 86% of all of our communities actually show this trend of, of missing these, these medium-sized carnivores. And, and just a note, I mean, this, this doesn't look particularly impressive when we see it on a graph like this, 
but this is not a small gap. When we're when we're talking about animals this size, um, if we were to compare this to something, uh, a modern mammal carnivore assemblage, something like um, Kruger National Monument, um, or sorry, Kruger National Park, um, if we were to shape the mammalian carnivore distribution in the same way that dinosaurs appear to be, we would lose all of the carnivorous mammals between the size of a bat-eared fox um, and in a, an adult African male lion. Um, so that is a huge, huge gap. It's very significant. It, the gap cannot be entirely explained by, by any kind of bias in the fossil record. Um, and in fact, on top of that, when we, when we do some statistics, we find that there's actually a significant correlation between the size of that gap in communities. There's this gap of, of missing uh, mesocarnivores. There's a, a significant correlation between the size of that gap and the size of the largest carnivore in the community. We think that there's something significant going on because not only is, is there that correlation there, we also don't find the gap in communities that don't have carnivores over a thousand kilograms. So this is not just like a randomized thing where we're seeing gaps in, in certain body sizes, regardless of any other factor. It is really, it, there's something to do with, with large carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, and because of that kind of repeated um, emphasis on these, these large carnivorous dinosaurs, things that are over a thousand kilograms, we started referring to them as megatheropods. And that's not just in reference to the fact that they are big because I mean, they are, um, but these things are, are animals that actually might be changing the, the actual structure of their community. So they might have this kind of outweighed influence on the ecosystem around them because of their size. So this brings us to our second question. What is causing the persistent gap in, in carnivore communities? So we have an inkling that it might have something to do with those megatheropods, but how exactly? 2012 was a great year for, for uh, dinosaur ontogeny. Uh, Cadrone et al. published a very interesting paper um, that kind of mathematically tested the potential for competition in dinosaurs throughout ontogeny. So looking at how juveniles of some dinosaurs might compete in their ecosystem. Um, and one of the predictions was actually the existence of a gap in the fossil record of dinosaurs between 100 and 1,000 kilograms. Exactly the same thing that we have, you know, kind of categorized in this paper, looking at actual at the actual fossil record. Um, and they hypothesized that this was due to the increased complexity of ontogeny in dinosaurs. So that's a lot of really big words. Let's unpack it a little bit, and let's let's get into why. Dinosaur growth, dinosaur ontogeny is so very weird. First off, the biggest problem here, or the biggest issue for dinosaurs at least, is that they are oviparous. They lay eggs, right? And granted, anything that's that's pooping out a ball full of uh, like teeth and feathers and claws is weird, but dinosaurs especially are weird because they're huge, right? Tyrannosaurus rex is, is the size of an African elephant. That is a giant animal to be laying an egg. Um, and it's particularly complex because eggs can only be so big. So elephants have this benefit of they're big and they have big babies, right? Because they give live birth. Tyrannosaurus can't, can't do that. It has to rely on an egg that is not much bigger than your average soccer ball, right? And that's because of gas exchange. Eggs can only get so big. So even if you're getting up to sauropod size, you're still going to start out the size of a border collie which means you have to spend a significant amount of your, of your life just getting to adult size. And we know from the few remaining giant predatory uh, egg-laying reptiles on the planet, things like Komodo dragons, that when there are big differences between the size of hatchlings and the size of adult animals, um, especially in animals that have little to no parental care, the infants and the juveniles of those species tend to exist in the ecosystem in their community in a very different way than the, their adult conspecifics. So by and large, um, the, the teeny tiny babies are not going to be physically capable of capturing or eat or consuming the same prey um, as, as the adults, right? So adult Komodo dragons are, are completely terrestrial predators. 
Um, they're known to regularly hunt and eat things the size of water buffalo. Um, but strangely, Komodo, uh, baby Komodo dragons are actually arboreal. They live in trees. They eat insects, right? So ecologically, despite the fact that they're the same species, through ontogeny, they're very different animals. So this phenomenon that, that we're talking about right here is called ontogenetic niche shift. Um, and that's a mouthful, but it basically just means that as you grow, you're, you're shifting, you're changing how you're interacting with your ecosystem, whether that is what you eat or when you're active or where you live. Um, we see this as a, as a general result of, of large disparities between neonate and adult size in egg laying organisms. And this is an important thing to understand because ontogenetic niche shift is actually a way to partition resources and reduce competition within a species. So for dinosaurs, um, which compared to mammal, mammals basically have very little ability to um, differentiate themselves as far as morphology. They don't really have specialized heterodont dentition, meaning that most of their teeth look exactly the same. So unlike something like a dog or a cat, they don't have specialized canines. They don't have chewing molars. Um, they really have, carnivorous dinosaurs really only have one way of, of eating things. Capturing prey is a little bit different, but eating things is fairly limited compared to at least modern mammals. Um, they also cannot, uh, they're a little bit too big to partition their ecosystem vertically. So um, with things like birds, we can see that you can have very, very similar morphology. You can have similar size. You can have similar eating habit, habits. If, you, if one of them happens to live in the upper canopy and another species happens to live lower down. So that is another way of separating resources in the ecosystem that dinosaurs, you're not, you're really not going to find a Tyrannosaurus rex on the top of a tree. They're just, they're too big. Um, it's not going to happen. So any form of resource partitioning, things like ontogenetic niche shift, are going to be especially important for large dinosaurs because they don't have the benefit of some of these other resource partitioning methods that we see in modern, modern organisms. And this becomes very, very important when we're looking at large organisms, um, because when multiple species end up in the same niche, um, where they're competing for the same food or you know, competing for the same space, um, we even see this in plants where you have plants competing for solar resources. Um, evolution tends to pick a winner. Uh, and over long enough periods of time, um, we actually start to see something called competitive exclusion, which is basically saying, one species is going to get just kicked out of this niche, um, and that is largely due to competition. Um, once again, body size comes into play here because the bigger you are, the faster this happens. So if you're a large animal competing with another large animal in a niche, one of you is going to get kicked out pretty quickly. So now if we go back to our question about that carnivore gap, based on what we know about dinosaur physiology, we would predict that it's actually the juveniles of these megatheropods that are going through ontogenetic niche shifts and inhabiting different niches through ontogeny. So that might be causing this gap through potential competitive exclusion. But remember, when we're looking at body size diversity, we're only examining the adult body size. So all of these, these examinations from the community level to the global level, when we're talking about a, a body mass distribution, by and large, that body mass is the adult body mass. We haven't really looked at what this, this could, how it could change if we started to look at the juveniles. Organisms of the same species, they're actually in, uh, inhabiting a different body size niche. So let's go ahead and do it. But how would we? How do we go about testing the influence of juvenile dinosaurs on their community? So first, we start with mass death. death English, mass death assemblages. Um, so these are in effect uh, snapshots in time, right? So this is where a lot of organisms die at the same time. It's a form of Lagerstatten. Um, and from these, we can get a good understanding of what we call the standing crop. So how many of each age dinosaur uh, was in a community? How many infants do we have? How many juveniles do we have? How many subadults? How many adults? Um, and we can figure this out based on the, the bone histology of dinosaurs, which um, very much like birds and crocodilians have things called lines of arrested growth. So very much like tree rings, 
we can cut a dinosaur limb bone open and basically count how many years it was alive. So we can very accurately figure out how many of, of each age class was in the community. On top of that, using that data for mass death assemblages, we can tell um, that for megatheropods, these large carnivorous dinosaurs, there's a pretty strong neonate die-off. So when we're looking at things like survivorship, so this is, is very similar to something like a sea turtle where, where you have um, our selected organisms that are laying tons of eggs and lots of them are getting picked off. Um, but the ones that survive, once they hit a certain size again, nothing's really touching them. They have that benefit of, of just being too big to kind of eat. Um, dinosaurs, we, we see a similar kind of pattern where a lot of the species of large megatheropod dinosaurs are, if you were to transport yourself back to the, the Cretaceous or even the Jurassic, what you would see is that most of these individuals are actually um, sub-adults, they're juveniles, they haven't reached sexual maturity yet. So megatheropods by and large are putting a ton of energy into reaching reproductive age, but then dying shortly thereafter. They're, they have this very live fast, die young kind of approach. And as somebody recently pointed out, um, when we're looking at the fossil record, what we, what we sh really should be doing is just assuming that anything that we're looking at is probably a juvenile. It's probably not hit full size unless there is a reason to believe that it has. So the other important thing that we can tell from those lines of arrested growth, um, as the name implies, is growth rate. So we can see that megatheropods were, were spending those extended periods of time growing through their juvenile and sub-adult stages. Um, most of their life is actually spent in that range. Um, but unfortunately, this, this doesn't actually tell us anything about how juvenile megatheropods are interacting with their ecosystem. So in order to do that, we need a way of comparing juveniles to the adults in the same communities. So what we can do is take that survivorship metric, you know, look at how many organisms are dying off if we have a hypothetical um, 10,000 individual cohort, how many survive from one year to the next. And we can combine that with the growth rate. So we can see from year one to year two to year three, how much are you growing? How much do you weigh? And from that, we can do a calculation called biomass, which is effectively looking at um, how much energetic load are you putting on an ecosystem? So for example, you could think of, um, so a 300 pound uh, male human has the same biomass as 10 30 pound toddlers, right? So this is pretty similar to what we're doing. And we can take that biomass estimate, which we, um, for our paper, we actually calculated this for um, six species of Tyrannosaurid um, and four species of Allosauroids. Um, and we can set the juveniles of each of those species as their own mass uh, category or within the mass categories that we had um, as their own morpho species. Um, and we can compare those morpho species, the juvenile morpho species to the adults. Um, and when we do that, we find that not only does the majority of that juvenile megatheropod biomass, not only does that fall predominantly within the carnivore gap, but the juvenile biomass is actually proportional to at least 80% of the biomass of adults for the majority of these species. So juveniles have a very significant influence on their ecosystem. If you think an adult Tyrannosaur Tyrannosaurus rex is influencing its ecosystem, the, its kids are actually more of a problem for, for the herbivores in the area. So with juveniles added, we start to see that the carnivore distributions start to shift back to resembling their global distribution a little bit more. So this is a strong indicator that, that we've kind of identified or at least gotten close to that ecological driver. So we have, at this point, independent verification based directly on abundances and growth rates from the fossil record of the very real influence that juvenile megatheropods would have had on their environment. So essentially, um, these juvenile megatheropods would have had a similar amount of influence on their community as adults of the same species. They would have exerted that influence predominantly in the 100 to 1,000 kilogram body size range, or more specifically, 300 to 1,000. So that is exactly that gap that we, we keep identifying in these communities, somewhat perfectly filled by these juveniles. 
So to sum up, we explored the distribution of dinosaur body size at different geographic scales. So we looked at the global, compared it to the communities. And we found that the small scale, the community distributions, don't really match the global distributions. That in itself indicates a potential ecological driver for body size in dinosaurs. Once we looked a little bit closer at that, we discovered that within the community distributions, it's the carnivores that have the largest disparity from their global pattern. And they have a consistent gap from 100 to 1,000 kilograms in, in body mass. This precisely matches the gap that was predicted by ontogenetic knit shift and competitive exclusion by Cadron et al. Finally, we found that juvenile megatheropods would have wielded a significant energetic and competitive influence over their communities. And this is a really important thing because the influence that those juveniles are exerting over their environment is going to affect everything from energetic studies to biodiversity to extinction um, and speciation. This really has wide ranging uh, effects on, on how we understand non-avian dinosaurs as, as organisms. That's all very cool, but now what, right? That paper's out, what are we working on now? So there's somewhat of a leftover burning question that I find very, very interesting. And that's the fact that the gap that we're talking about in carnivores, that 100 to 1,000 kilogram gap, um, it exists throughout time. So it's, it's quite stable in the sense that it shows up in the Jurassic, sticks around to the end of the Cretaceous, but it's not stable as far as how big it is. It actually grows fairly significantly through time. So in the Jurassic, we have kilograms of, of mass separation on average throughout these communities. So what is it about the Cretaceous or what is it about the Jurassic that um, seems to be modifying this gap? So recall that there was some pretty strong diversity in those smaller uh, smaller size bins for carnivore, uh, carnivorous dinosaurs. That spike might actually be attributable to the rapid diversification of Manoraptora. So um, there's been some, some hypothesizing. Um, Resende et al. demonstrated that these guys might actually be shifting towards endothermy and developing that, that um, maintenance of, of body temperature might actually allow them to these smaller dinosaurs to compete more effectively with small mammals, birds, and other small dinosaurs. So that competitive pressure at the low end of carnivore body size might have really ramped up, especially towards the end of the Cretaceous. And the Cretaceous, of course, is also when tyrannosaurs become proper megatheropods. So for, for a lot of their existence, um, tyrannosaurs are actually the small, measly kind of guys that are not doing much in their ecosystem. Um, but in the Cretaceous, they become truly gigantic. Um, and Thomas Holtz, um, recently published a paper exploring just how influential that large body size in tyrannosaurs might have been in, uh, in relation to ontogenetic knit shift. And he hypothesizes that uh, they might not have just taken over those medium size size bins. They might have not just kicked out the, the medium sized carnivores. They might have actually taken over um, Asia America from all of the big dinosaurs as well. So this might be a really, really interesting thing to look at in specifically with tyrannosaurs. There's also a huge turnover in herbivore diversity from Jurassic to the Cretaceous. So um, a lot of the enormous sauropods, these, these huge walking tanks of, of energy, um, it's replaced by diversity in smaller dinosaurs like ceratopsians and hadrosaurs in the Cretaceous. So it's possible the Jurassic megatheropods that were relying on those, those immense sauropod food sources, um, or possibly that were actually specialized to consume sauropods, they might have buckled under the pressure of, of suddenly having to compete with smaller theropods. So we know that tyrannosaurs um, and tyrannosaurs in North, uh, abelosaurs in the South also dominated in the Cretaceous. Um, but how did they assimilate the niches of other megatheropods? You know, there, there's a few ways that this could have happened. Maybe they were better at shifting their niche through ontogeny. Um, maybe that was a, a precursor to them getting big, which would have decreased their intraspecific competition. So between adults and juveniles, they would have been competing with one another quite a bit less. Or 
maybe their growth pattern, that oncogenetic knit shift, is actually a byproduct of already having specialized morphology that favored them following that faunal turnover. Maybe they were just really, really good at eating things like ceratopsians. Um, the way of addressing both of those questions would be to look at the stability of the megatheropod niche over time. Is there a large shift in that niche from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous? Um, specifically, when we compare juveniles against adults of different species, how much are they over, overlapping in their niche space? And this is actually a project that I'm currently working on um, some, with some collaborators from the Smith Lab at the University of New Mexico. We're attempting to use functional diversity, which is instead of looking at morphological diversity, we actually assign functional traits to those things or, or rely on, on previous uh, assignment of functional traits. Um, to look at some of these extreme disparities between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous carnivores. Um, and we are specifically trying to look at how the juvenile megatheropods compare functionally to the adults of different species, specifically from that Jurassic into the Cretaceous uh, transition. So with that, I'm, looks like three minutes over, man, almost hit my target. Um, I would like to very much thank my collaborators, Felicia Smith and Kate Lyons, um, the PBDB for being just a fantastic data resource, um, and especially thank the, the Science Museum of Virginia for inviting me to speak. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. What evidence do we see from the fossil record for what these juvenile dinos might have been eating? Is there any predation evidence or anything like that we can see? So there is, um, specifically for some of the um, older Tyrannosaurid dinosaurs, um, we have feeding traces because they're, they're, of course, bone crunchers, right? So even uh, juvenile Tyrannosaurs are not really as, as robust as adults, but they were still managing to get down to the level of bone when they're eating. And we do have some, some feeding traces of juvenile Tyrannosaurs. I believe it's Albertosaurus. Um, where you can see that this animal is actually eating a part of the pre-consumed carcass of a large hadrosaur. Um, and we know that it's, that it's uh, somewhat of scavenging behavior because it's eating part of the animal that's really not ideal to eat. It's eating kind of the base of the tail. Um, and because it's getting down into that bone, it's, it's pretty likely that it's not chomping through the entire mass of muscle. It's probably eating something, it's stripping flesh off of the bone that has already been predominantly consumed by another animal. So we do see some direct evidence from the fossil record of, of feeding behavior. Another project that I'm actually working on is looking at the micro texture on Tyrannosaur teeth, so dental micro textural analysis. Um, and we're actually getting some results that, that indicate that um, their feeding method between juveniles and adults of certain Tyrannosaur species might have been significantly different. So the difference even between um, something like a cheetah versus a lion. Um, so that indicates that they might have actually been eating the same foods, but they might have been um, they might have been predating them differently. They might have been relying more or less on scavenging. Um, and it, there, there's these different differences of, of partitioning of, of direct feeding ecology, although it's really, really hard to actually get at that from the fossil record. There's a uh, question I read about the recent paper on teenage rexes. Do you personally think this means nanotyrannus is just another chain? Um, personally, I do, um, but that is not for my own research. That is, um, I am not a morphologist. I am not one of those folks that does like the huge monographs. Um, I think they're extremely impressive. But for those kind of things, I rely on the opinion of folks like Thomas Carr, Thomas Williamson, um, Thomas Holtz. There's lots of Thomases and Tyrannosaurs. Um, so for the, the predominant response uh, on this subject, um, most dinosaur paleontologists are leaning towards Nanotyrannus being a, a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, and then there is a question, I've learned about Big Al from the Ballad of Big Al um, and about Big Al 2 being a larger Allosaurus specimen. What do you personally think about this in regard to Sorophaganex as Allosaurus maximus? Um, that's a really interesting question. We're not clear on whether Sorophaganex might be just an adult morph of Allosaurus. Allosaurus is really interesting because it has multiple species that are relatively similar in morphology that seem to be slightly subdivided um, by um, ecological space, so by, ge by geography. Um, 
I, I'm not sure. It, it is a fantastic question. Um, if that is, so Sorphagonax is, is found um, fairly remotely. It is not found with other species of Allosaurus. So if we were to find another species of Allosaurus sharing the same ecosystem with Sorphagonax, that might point more, it would give us better evidence to understand that question a little bit more. Um, another question, virtually all of our T-Rex fossils show ages of not more than 35 years. Does your research provide any information on how T-Rex grew so large in such short lifespans? So 35 years is actually a really long time. If you, if you compare this to something like a bird, um, most birds are not living particularly long. Um, 35 years, 40 years, I've heard um, for some estimates, uh, for example, Sue, um, my research doesn't specifically provide any kind of um, of indication about how they did that. It 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 might point towards uh, towards to why they die, um, and that is uh, something that is in relation to energetic bottlenecking. So um, when we see this really strong selection towards um, very large clutch sizes um, and a lot of reliance of energy going into actual growth and not um, once you're somatically mature or once you're sexually mature, putting so much energy into that, um, there are quite a few animals, uh, particularly fish, that end up with this kind of uh, balancing act where the adults have to create the babies, but the babies are eating all of the energy. So it's it's this weird kind of back and forth flux that we see in some species that might indicate why adults are really not surviving very long, because basically what they're doing energetically is surviving just long enough to reproduce once, twice, three, three or four times, and then just kicking off because there's not enough energy based on how many juveniles are in the in the, in the ecosystem eating up all that food. Um, if you are interested alternatively in how they get that big, um, Greg Erickson has done some really, really great work on, on how they're growing and how quickly they're growing. There was a new paper in 2021, uh, and oh, I am uh, horrible. I am forgetting the, the author of that paper, um, but they actually looked at heterochrony in, in theropod dinosaurs and found that tyrannosaurs specifically have a very, um, very extreme growth pattern where they're growing very, very quickly um, through their, their sub-adult and adult stages, getting very large very quickly. Um, compare that to some older Jurassic megatheropods and you have a more kind of gradual sinusoidal growth rate. Um, so there is some differences there. Um, T-Rex just seems to be this, this kind of exemplary um, species. It is really, really fascinatingly different. Um, that said, um, one of the things that I like to point out, because it's not, it's not only about T-Rex, um, we, we know shockingly little about some other large megatheropods, and a lot of work still needs to be done in order for us to, to understand more about that. So there might be something that's not just T-Rex. Um, there might be something with abelosaurs as well, because we see them taking over in, in the southern continents. Um, there might be something specific to the, the growth rate of juvenile th megatheropods that allows them to cohabitate more, more effectively with other smaller theropods. We don't know because we haven't found as many of those and not as much research is done on those non-tyrant dinosaurs. With the growth rate in sauropods, have you been able to determine the ages of some specimens from the growth rings? Yes. Um, I, not me specifically, but it has been done. Um, sauropod growth is actually really fairly well understood, um, particularly um, if you're referring to um, the, the proper clade sauropoda, um, there has been, been some examination, um, not quite as much as what we have with uh, things like hadrosaur ceratopsians, um, and prosauropods are actually um, fairly well studied because we have that question about um, facultative bipedalism. Um, so they've really been looked at as, as uh, really exemplary um, members of the clade in, in terms of, of their morphological disparity. Um, sauropods are not my forte. I'm, I'm a carnivore person, but that research is definitely out there. And we do know quite a bit about the potential age of, of different sizes of sauropods. I think that's it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it looks like we are actually out of time. Uh, it's good that you did mention uh, Dr. Thomas Holtz's work. Uh, 
If you missed it, uh, we did have uh, Dr. Holtz with us for Lunch Break Science uh, earlier in the summer. You can catch that on our YouTube playlist. Next Wednesday, September 15th at noon, I will be myself. I'll be presenting Charles Babbage, Ada Lovelace, and the Victorian Clockwork Computer. You can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all for coming.